Okay, good morning, everyone. So, over the last few days, we've talked about uh, things like modeling and meta modeling, how we can construct domain specific languages using EMF, and then how we can develop graphical editors for our domain specific languages using GMF, a framework that sits on top of, uh, on top of EMF. And we've also talked about how we can then instantiate our meta models using the editors that EMF and GMF um, helps us develop. However, this is not the end of the story. We don't model for the sake of it. Actually, this is all preparatory work. Um, the real value we get out of models in model-driven engineering is not just drawing them and then looking at them, right? Um, we need to be able to process models in an automated way. So we need to be able to query models to extract information of interest. We need to be able to um, identify errors and inconsistencies in our models, so write and evaluate constraints against them. We need to be able to write model to text transformations in order to produce textual artifacts such as code or documentation or deployment scripts. Um, sometimes we also need to transform our models to other types of models and we will talk about this uh, later. We also need to be able to compare and merge our models and to identify patterns uh, of interest in, in our models. So, This has stopped working. Okay. So what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to introduce Epsilon, which is a family of programming languages for model management tasks such as these. Uh, we're going to talk about, in this first hour, we're going to talk about the core language of Epsilon, which is called EOL. Uh, standing for Epsilon Object Language, and then we're going to talk about um, a language that sits on top of EOL that extends its syntax and provides support for model validation called EVL. Uh, after the break, we will talk about model-to-model -model and model-to-text transformation using two more languages of Epsilon, uh, ETL and EGL. So, um, why do we need dedicated languages? Why don't we just use Java to, 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 pro, to process our, our models? Um, model management languages, such as the ones um, we're going to talk about, uh, provide the tailored syntax for model management, so they encode uh, lots of recurring activities um, in, in model management. And what's more is that they are adapted to the requirements of each model management task. So they, they provide primitives that really focus on on common activities for every model management task. For example, EVL, the model validation language of, uh, of Epsilon, has a, um, a default, has a built-in construct called constraint. It has a built-in construct called fix to encode how we can fix problems um, identified by failed constraints. However, all of these languages also have commonalities. So when we're managing models, we need to be able to query models. We need to be able to get, for example, all instances of a type. Given a model element, we need to be able to navigate its properties. We need to be able to filter out model elements and so on and so forth. There's no shortage of model management languages out there. This is just a small example. Uh, a, small, a small list of uh, uh, perhaps the most prominent model management languages out there. So we have a set of standards to start with, um, managed by the OMG, the Object Management Group. We have languages such as OCL for model validation and MOFT text for model to text transformation and QVT standing for queries, views and transformations. This is actually a family of languages. So we have QVT relational, we have QVT operational, etc for model-to-model -model transformation. Um, then in the Eclipse space, uh, we have Axelo, which is a model-to-text transformation language. Another one is JET. Um, ATL, which is developed here in, in Nant uh, predominantly. This is uh, perhaps the most widely used model-to-model -model transformation language uh, out there. Then, um, languages such as Expand uh, for model-to-text transformation. Viatra, which is developed in, in Budapest, and the inquiry 
which is developed by Inquiry Labs, which is a, a partner of this, of this consortium uh, as well. So no shortage of, uh, of model management languages. Um, however, one issue with, uh, with model management languages is that most of these languages have been independently developed. So uh, therefore, while they have similar syntaxes, as some of them have similar syntaxes, uh, it's not possible to write a piece of code, say, in Axello and then reuse it from ATL. So you cannot write a function in Axello, then reuse it from ATL. Or um, do that, for example, between uh, OCL, even OCL and ATL, because the flavors of OCL that the two languages support are, are different. So this really, this fragmented landscape of individually and independently uh, developed model management languages motivated the development of Epsilon um, almost 15 years ago now. Um, so Epsilon is a family of model management languages uh, that, that provides support for most of the, uh, of the common model management tasks. Uh, things like model validation and model to model and model to text transformation and model migration, pattern matching, to name a few. And the main difference between uh, Epsilon and what I mentioned, what I referred to here as a fragmented landscape, is that all of these languages in Epsilon build on top of a common uh, expression language for model querying and validation. So this means that uh, code. Uh, that these languages can now talk to each other and they can share code and we can write a function in the, um, in the common expression language of the platform EOL and then uh, that function can be reused in all the different languages uh, that sit on, on top of it. So programs written in Epsilon languages, whether these are model-to-model uh, -model transformations, validation constraints, and so on and so forth, they can read and write many models at the same time. And they can also um, read and write models developed using different technologies. This is facilitated by um, an abstraction framework that sits just below EOL called Epsilon Model Connectivity. And if you are familiar with, uh, with Java, you will see the um, and the similarity to, to JDBC here. It's the same concept, but not for databases for models this time, uh, where EMC provides a set of interfaces that then uh, different concrete drivers implement uh, to make themselves available to EOL and to languages sitting, uh, sitting on top of it. So we can have a model-to-model -model transformation in this way that consumes uh, an EMF model and, for example, produces a Simulink model or it produces a, a CSV file or just plain XML because Epsilon provides drivers for all of these. So we can mix and match models conforming to different technologies in the context of the same um, model management program. Okay, so let's focus on, on EOL now, the, the core language of Epsilon, and then we will also talk later about EVL, ETL, and EGL. So these three languages uh, up here. So EOL is the, the expression, the core expression language of Epsilon. It's an imperative programming language. Um, it's dynamically typed, so uh, you don't get much helpful uh, code completion, for instance, in the editor. Its syntax has been influenced historically by OCL, the Object Constraint Language, um, and JavaScript. And it can be used both as a standalone language, and we'll see how, it, how, how we can use it as such, but also as an embedded expression language in higher level languages of the Epsilon platforms. Okay, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll use this small uh, example, this small flowchart to, to talk about the EOL and the different features. It, it provides this meta model, uh, sorry, this model uh, conforms to a simplified version of the flowchart meta model we developed over the last few days. So here we have a flowchart that contains nodes that are just actions or decisions and then transitions between uh, actions and, uh, and decisions. 
Okay, and instead of showing you the syntax of EOL on, on, on slides, I'll do a quick live demo. So we'll walk through the different features of the language using, uh, using live examples. Okay. So here I have, a, I have a small model conforming to my simplified flowchart language, which I call SimpleChart, right? And uh, as you see, this is a GMF editor. So um, in this file, this file only keeps the layout information of my model. My real model lives in this other uh, dot simple chart file. That, that's what we discussed yesterday. Okay, so uh, let's create a small EOL program to start querying this, this model. So I'll just create a file called, uh, let's call it simplechart.eol. I don't need the palette for now. I'm not going to be doing much editing. So um, classes of our meta model in EOL become types, right? And one of, the, uh, one of the very common things that we need to do when we write a model management program is to get all instances of a type in our model. So all model elements that conform that are instances of that type. For example, here uh, we may want to get all instances of uh, uh, action. And then print. Let's get a bit more space here. Okay, and then print um, the size of this of this collection. So action get all of type will just will return all instances of action in in a model. Okay, um, so we're ready to run our program. Actually, let's switch to the epsilon perspective so that we get our run button here. Okay, so in order to run our program, we need to create a, uh, a run configuration the same way we run a Java application in Eclipse or we run a, an instance of Eclipse uh, from, from within Eclipse. So we need to go to our run configurations, select EOL program, create a new configuration. It will pick up the, um, the active file, right? So it knows that it needs to run this program. Now what we need to also configure here is which model this program will run against, right? So far we've said we want to execute this program. We haven't said that we want to execute this program against this model over here. So in order to do that, we need to go to the models tab of the run configuration. We need to add a new model, select EMF model because that's what we're uh, that's what we want to consume. And you can see there are many other options. So these are the different drivers that uh, are implemented below that Epsilon model connectivity framework that I showed here. Right? So all of these drivers uh, is what you get in this, in this screen. Okay, so I'm adding an EMF model. I'll just call it M for now. Um, names are not important when we run a program against one model, but when we run a program against more than one model, we need to be able to differentiate between them, so then names become important. We will talk about this a bit later. Okay, and I need to select the actual file that contains my model. See, I'm not selecting the diagram, I'm selecting the, the, the file that contains the abstract, the abstract syntax. 
Um, and I want to read this model when I start my program, but I don't want to save it if I make accidentally any changes to it, if I delete any elements or if I create any elements. I don't want them to be persisted. So, okay. And then when we run that, we get three here because we have three actions in our model. And we can do the same for decisions. And we only have one decision in our model. Um, a shorthand notation for get all of type is dot all. So instead we could just write decision dot all dot size, right? That will still return all instances of, uh, of decision. Um, of course, if we think about inheritance, all of these are nodes. If, we, if you remember our meta model, both decision and action inherit from node. So here I could also say node.all, and that would print four, because that will print all the uh, direct and indirect instances of node in the, in the model. Uh, I can do the same with transitions because transitions are model elements too in our language. So if I run this, I'll get again four because I have these, these four transitions. Yes? So we work on the names of the DNS and EOL at the same time, right? So uh, actually EOL is only interested in this EMF model, right? Mm -hmm. So the GMF, uh, the diagram, it's just the layout information for the information contained in this model. What EOL consumes is actually this model. Uh, it's not the diagram. Okay, I understand the, the confusion. So if we look at the meta model of this simple chart oh, language, okay. there is a class called node, right? Good. Um, so EOL also supports uh, constructs that you would expect from an imperative uh, programming language. So for example, uh, we can have four loops. So you can have something like for uh, action in action dot all. And then here we can print the label of, of that action. If we run this, okay. So we don't have a label, but we have a name in our actions, right? Um, you will see how EOL is not statically typed. So you don't get this as a compile time error, so to speak, you only get this as a, as a run error. And dynamically versus ty statically typed languages, they have their pros and, and cons. Okay, so if I run this again, I should get the names of all my actions. Um, we, can have some, we can have an if, for example, here. So if action.name.length is greater than uh, six, then only then print the action name. and that will not print the name of this one. So the regular kind of imperative constructs that you, uh, that you expect. Um, println prints to, to the console. It's the equivalent of system out println in, in Java. Uh, but what's nice about it is that it's not non-invasive. So you can put it anywhere in an expression and it will return whatever it's invoked on, right? So here, for example, uh, if we wanted to print also the lengths of, uh, of the different action names, we can add the print a length statement here that will print that number and also return it. So it's still valid within the, the expression. If I was to run this again and comment this out, We'll see the different the different lengths of the action names without actually affecting uh, the the expression. Um, 
this is a similar method to print things to the error stream. Uh, if you want to, to, to highlight some, some output. Um, okay, so let's see how we can iterate collections efficiently in, uh, in EOL. If we wanted to get all actions that have more, that have a label with say more than six characters, using conventional um, imperative constructs, we'd have to say something like uh, filtered, which is a uh, sequence. So EOL supports four types of collections, depending on whether they are ordered and unique. So if a collection is ordered and unique, it's an ordered set. If it's ordered but not unique, it's a sequence. If it's not ordered and not unique, it's a set. It's a bug, and if it's uh, non-unique, and if it's unique but not ordered, it's a set. So we have four types. We have set, sequence, ordered set, and bug. Okay, and the set is uh, uh, unordered and unique. A sequence is ordered and non-unique, an ordered set is ordered and unique, and a bag is unordered, non-unique. Okay, so um, if we wanted to collect all actions that have uh, um, a label with uh, more than six characters, we'd need to do something like this. So if action dot name dot length is greater than six, then filtered dot add action. Okay, and then uh, we can print. the size of this filtered collection. And if we run this, we get two, because we have only two actions that have a label with, more, with, a, um, with a name with more than six characters. Um, so this is quite verbose, and this is actually something we need to do very often when we're writing model management programs, get some collection of elements and filter out some and or reject some. Um, so Therefore, EOL supports uh, first order logic operations instead. So instead of doing this, instead of doing all of this, we could instead do action.all.select an action where the action.name.length is greater than six. print the land. Right? And this is not dissimilar to what you find these days in what you find in functional languages or what you find even in Java uh, after the, the addition of streams. Um, there's a number of operations of this sort in EOL. So select will produce a subset of the of the collection you invoke it on. Exists will tell you if there's one element, if there's uh, at least one element, right? So that will return true here. Uh, reject will do the opposite of select, so it will reject all the elements that meet this condition. So if we run this, we only get a sequence with one action, which is get up. Um, for all checks that the condition holds for all of the elements of the collection. So if I run this, I'll get false because it doesn't hold for this element. Um, and then there's another operation that we can use to not filter a collection, but collect stuff from a collection. So here I could collect all the names of all actions, and that would give me back a sequence of strings.
right? So I'm not getting back actions anymore. I'm getting back uh, strings. Um, a shorthand notation for doing this in, uh, in EOL is to just use the, the property name. So you can use a property name on a collection and that will return the values of the property of all elements in that, uh, in that collection. Um, now, in the same way, I could collect, say, all the outgoing transitions of all actions. And what this will return, what, what do you think this will return? A sequence of what? A sequence of transitions, yes. So action.all will return these three. So a collection containing these three actions, right? This one? And this one. Right? Because these two are outgoing transitions from actions. What you might find a little bit surprising is that it actually returns a collection of collections. Because if we look at the meta model, outgoing is a multi-valued reference, so it returns a collection. Mm -hmm. So when we call that property on an, a collection of objects, we will get a collection of collections. And that can go to a collection of collections of collections, like forever. <laughs> so in this case, we can use the built-in flatten operation. And that will just flatten these collections of collections of collections into a flat collection, right? Good. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the output. We have a sequence. Let's actually do this. So for uh, value in so that we get them in separate lines. So it's a collection. The result is a collection that consists of these three collections, of these three ordered sets. OK? This one. It doesn't have any outgoing yeah. transitions, so it's empty. OK. Um, so we saw how in eCore we can define uh, data types and we can define references and so on and so forth. What we cannot define is operations. Or we can define the signature of operations, but not, not their bodies. Therefore, uh, to kind of fill that gap, EOL provides support for user-defined operations for attaching user-defined operations on existing types. So we can define an operation called, uh, um, in the context of node, called uh, uh, has next, which returns a Boolean. And here we can define that has next. So for a, no, for a, a node to have a next, it needs to have at least one outgoing transition. Otherwise, it's the end of the, of the workflow. So return self, which is like this in Java. So it refers to the current object on which the operation is called dot outgoing 
dot is empty. Not. Okay? So now this means that we can invoke this operation on model elements of type node. So we can say for action in action dot all action dot has next dot print land. And that will give us true and false. For the, for the last one. Uh, in println, we can also put some text to prefix what it's going to print. So here I'm going to put right? So you can see that it's true for wake up, it's true for go back to sleep, but it's false for get up, which is what we'd expect. So in this way, we can extend our meta model, and we can add more operations to existing uh, to existing types. Uh, we can also do this in the context of primitive types. So uh, we could have an operation uh, in the context of integer called uh, plus one, which also returns an integer, and we could say well return self plus one, and then we could do five. Plus one dot print len, and that would just print six. Okay, so we can add operations to um, uh, types that come from the meta model, but also to, to primitive types. Okay, um, we can also create elements and delete elements in EOL. So, what I'll do here is I will create a new action. And I will call action created from EOL. And um, I will put this action under my flowchart model element, right? Because everything needs to be contained at some, at some point. So I first need to get hold of my flowchart element. It's just another model element. So I'm doing a flowchart dot all dot first. So the first flowchart element and I know that there's going to be only one. Dot nodes dot add a. Okay, so if I run this again and then I do a action dot all dot size dot print land, what am I going to get back? Four. Exactly. Now, if I look at my model, nothing has happened here, right? So I created the action, but it's not here. And that's because in my run configuration, I said that any changes I, I do to my model, I don't want to be persisted, okay? So if I now tick this box and run it again, you'll see how this um, how this action has appeared in my model and then GMF has picked it up and has created a graphical view for it as well, right? So still EOL knows nothing about this diagram. It just changed the model here, it added this action and the diagram picked it up and created a, uh, a graphical view for it. Okay, um, in the same way I can delete model elements. So I could delete the one I just created. So you will provide this uh, delete keyword, right? And that will delete a model element and also remove it from any references of other model elements uh, for a, in which it may live. Okay, and this is how that, uh, that model element disappears. Uh, yeah, what happens if I delete the uh, get up, for example? If you delete what? Get up. So if you delete get up, it will yeah, delete. Yeah. Yeah. The transition will remain. Oh. 
It will not be visualized because it doesn't point to anything, but in the model it will remain with an empty target. Okay? Good. Um, so another interesting thing you can do with, with EOL is to fall back to Java if you have to. Um, all major programming languages provide some sort of escape mechanism from Java. You can fall back to C if you have to. Uh, from EOL, you can fall back to Java. And in order to do that, um, uh, EOL provides the native data type. So let's get rid of this and say var frame is a new native. So here I'm creating a, a Java J frame and doing a frame set bounds. So if I run this. I'll get a Java J frame. So any libraries uh, we may have that are kind of complex computations and they're, they're implemented in Java, we can reuse uh, within EOL by kind of branching out to, uh, to Java. Um, in this tools view of EOL, you will find uh, a number of uh, built-in uh, Java tools. So here, for example, is a math tool that has things like log and bitwise and uh, um, like trigonometric operations and so on and so forth. And you can add your own, um, your own what we call uh, tools, essentially built in Java classes. Okay. Right. So uh, there is more information on EOL in the slides, but I won't bore you anymore. We'll move on to the next language of Epsilon, which is EVL, the model validation language. And it's a language we use to write, uh, to write constraints for our models. Okay, um, so EVL extends EOL and it provides uh, some additional syntax, additional syntactic constructs that make model validation easier. So what would be a constraint that we'd want to check in our model? Let's see. Maybe we would want to check that decisions have at least two outgoing um, transitions, right? Because there's no, no point in having a decision if you only have one option. Okay, so what we're going to do is let's just draw that a little bit more. So we will write some constraints and we will use EVL for that. So I will create a new EVL program and I'll call that simplechart.evl, right? It's just a regular text file. Giving it the EVL suffix just makes the, the EVL editor recognize it and provide syntax highlighting. So in EVL, constraints are grouped according to the types of elements on which they apply. So if I wanted to write a constraint for decisions, I would start and say, well, I will create a context decision. And this will host all the constraints that refer to decisions. So here I can now write my constraint. Uh, which is called has more than one outgoing. And here I need to specify what this constraint checks. So in the check part, what I want to happen is that I want my decision, the outgoing transitions of my decision to be at least Right? Okay, so that's, that's everything. Now we can run this constraint against our model and see what happens. In order to run our constraint, 
well, if you notice, this is just EOL, right? So I'm just reusing the syntax that we talked about. So here I could do an action.all and I could use selects and collects and so on and so forth. So I have my constraints. I'm going to run them in a very similar way that I did with, with EOL. So I'm going to EVL validation here. Um, now I'm not going to EOL program because I need to run a set of EVL constraints. I double click and that they, uh, the active uh, file is getting picked up here and I need to specify which model I'm going to run this, these constraints on. Okay, so I'll choose an EMF model and then I'll call it M, again it doesn't matter and it's my uh, that default simple chart. It picks up its meta model automatically. If it doesn't, you have done something wrong, right? Uh, and we're going to read on load and store on disposal because later on we will add some fixes to our constraints so that we can fix issues that are, are identified. Okay, so if I run this, yay. Okay, my validation comes back clear, no problems here. Okay, so let's now delete this, uh, uh, this transition. If I run my constraints again, I'll get this error marker here saying invariant has more than one outgoing failed for this particular decision. Okay, this is nice, but this is not the kind of error you would want to show to a user. So they would have to infer what's going on just by looking at the name of the constraint. That would look weird. What you can do in EVL is you can specify a human readable message as well. So you could say something like decision must have more than one outgoing transitions. And this is an EOL expression, so you can produce as complicated messages as you wish here. Now if we run this again, we get a much more sensible error. Decision too early must have more than one outgoing transitions. Yes, you, yes, in order to do that, uh, uh, there is an article on the Epsilon website that shows how you can attach these constraints to your editor so that when you do, when you validate from within your editor, you get a red marker here that says, well, this is wrong, right? Yeah, that, that is supported. Um, now, if we wanted to, uh, if, we want, if we had a more complex kind of uh, error message construction logic or a more complex um, check part. Uh, we are not just confined to using an expression here, we could use an entire block of statements. So here if I change to curly brackets, I can do lots of work and eventually have a return statement. So here we could have lots and lots of code that checks uh, the, the property that we wish and then at the end it just returns uh, a boolean. So if I run this, we'll get exactly the same. Uh, and the same happens with message. Again, I could put this in curly brackets in a return statement. I could have more complex construction logic. Okay, I'll get this back into an expression for now. What does it want, right? Um, what else? Yes, um, so sometimes for some of our constraints, uh, it's, it's trivial to, to fix them, right? So we can provide, we can provide an easy fix and uh, we can automate that fixing instead of asking the user to go and, and do something. So let's create another uh, constraint. Um, this time I will create a critique. So a constraint, constraints when they're violated, they produce errors, critique, critiques produce warnings, right? So you'll get a yellow icon instead of a red icon. 
So let's have a critique. Let's actually create it in a different context. So I will create one in the context of nodes. So this will apply to all nodes and we'll have a constraint called uh, starts name, well, critique I said. Name starts with uppercase. And here I want to check that self.name is the same as self.name.first to uppercase. Okay? And I will I will create another transition here. And I'll go here, I'll go to the properties view and change this to get up, right? So now I should get a warning about this element because its name doesn't start with an uppercase letter, okay? So I'll run my constraints again and you can see how now I'm getting this uh, yellow icon here which means that this is a warning. And I could provide a more sensible uh, error message here like I did before. Yes? So for, for the statement, well, like when, when you for statement, you use uh, uh, one echo, not the double echo. So how, if you want to assign a value, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for instance, to a value, and then you have to... Oh, to I see, I see what you're saying. Uh, it's the same operator apply, does assignment as well, right? You could use equals equals as well, that works too in the OL, right? But it for assignment. E equals equals for, uh, for checking, for equality checking, right? So, um, so now what the user would need to do would be to go here and go to the properties view and fix the name of this, um, um, of this action. But we can actually automate this. So I can write a fix in my constraint mm -hmm. and say that, well, the title of this fix is uh, Rename to self dot name dot first to uppercase, and then in the do part of my fix, I can change the name. And now this is an assignment statement, right? Okay. So when I run this again. I will get my, my invariant here. Here you can see that now my run configuration has not really ended because there are fixes that the user might want to invoke. So if I right click here, I'm getting this quick fix, which is renamed to get up. Now no more fixes are left, so the program can, can, ter can terminate and my model has been, uh, has been updated. Um, one last thing about, uh, about EVL is uh, uh, the fact that we can have dependencies between constraints. So we I could have a constraint here that says that uh, name not empty to make sure that we don't have any unnamed nodes that have like no name at all. So here what I'd want to check is that self.name dot is defined. And this is a built-in operation in, uh, uh, in EOL that checks whether a string is null or empty. Well, not, not uh, it doesn't have a value really. So now, if I run, so if I just rename this and just delete its name, right. So I'm using this first to uppercase method, which assumes 
that, they, that that string has at least one character and it's trying to turn its first character to uppercase. I could have an if here that says, well, if the thing doesn't have a name, then don't, 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 don't bother. But this would be essentially replicating this constraint over here. So instead, what I can do is I can say, you should only check this constraint. if the element already satisfies this constraint. So now if I run this again, because this constraint failed, this constraint will never be executed for this, uh, for this element, for the same element, right? So we can have um, dependencies between constraints uh, as well. Okay, I think that's it for the first hour. Any questions? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I mean there's documentation on the Epsilon website. There's a book uh, on the Epsilon website that documents the syntax of EOL and uh, EBL and all the built-in types and built-in operations. It's about 200 pages or something. Yeah. Yes. Okay, any questions before we break? No? Okay, we all need coffee. And let's uh, come back in 10 minutes. Order, right? And here I have a very small uh, instance model of that, of that meta model with two work packages and four deliverables split uh, across them. So we need to be able to consume this model and produce such a table, for example, in HTML or in LaTeX, because this is our end artifact. This is what we're going to submit to the funder. How can we do this? Actually, we already know how to do this, because we have a language that we can use to, um, uh, to query the model, to extract information about work packages and deliverables and so on and so forth. It also does string concatenation. So we could <coughs> use EOL uh, and we could construct a big HTML string that starts with uh, uh, the, ta the table definition, the uh, definition of the header row, and then for every deliverable create a new row and add one cell for the, uh, for the name of the deliverable, for the um, well, for the number of the deliverable, for the number of its work packet, and for the due date, so that we end up with something like that. Um, what, what, what are the issues you see with this code? Is there anything about this code that you don't like? Don't look for an error. I mean, there's, I don't think there's an error there. I mean, the style of the code. <coughs> yes, that, it has a lot of visual noise. It has this HTML plus equals everywhere. It has these double quotes everywhere. So it's not it's not particularly readable or, or maintainable. Also, it doesn't follow the structure of the target HTML. It follows the it follows the structure of EOL. So it's not very intuitive to see what's going on. <coughs> and here's where EGL comes into play. <coughs> so um, EGL is what we call a template-based model to text transformation language. And there are many other languages that fall into this category. Um, Axelio, for example. Um, uh, languages like Jet and Velocity and Free Markers, some of these are beyond the, the Eclipse ecosystem, they're general purpose, kind of Java based, uh, uh, template based languages. What all these languages have in common is that they support two types of sections. They support the static section, so this is content that is emitted as it is in the target file, and then they also support dynamic regions which contribute information from some sort of input, from some sort of, of, of source. In the case of model-based uh, model to text transformation, this source is, is a model. So in EGL, uh, these two types of sections are encoded using these delimiters. 
So we get a square bracket percentage uh, and the percentage square bracket as the delimiter for uh, for dynamic statements. And then if we want to emit a value in the in the output, we have this extra equals character at the beginning of the of the ACM, uh, delimiter. And this makes transformations much more easier, uh, much easier to write and uh, easier to maintain. So here's how we, we would write the same uh, transformation using EGL, right? So the blue text is static content. This will be emitted to our file, as it to our uh, target file as it is. Within these delimiters, we have EOL statements. So here we have a for loop. So for every deliverable um, in the collection of deliverables sorted by due date, we print a new row and then a new cell, and we put here the number of the, of the work packets of the deliverable, the number of the deliverable, the number of the work packets of the deliverable, and the due date, right? And now this follows the structure of the target artifact, so this looks a lot more like HTML, and we also don't have, have all these HTML plus equals and the double quotes and so on and so forth. So arguably this is much easier to write and much, and much uh, more maintainable. Now, uh, we also said that we want to be able to generate one, uh, one table for every work package that lists the deliverables of that work package. And for that, uh, for that transformation, we need a slightly different template. So we need something that emits a, a heading, a, a HTML heading with a work packet number and the title. Right? And then we have a table that lists the deliverables of that, uh, of that work packet. So slightly different template. It still consumes from the same model, but it produces a different information as, uh, as output. Now, what we are missing here is something that says, well, run this template for every work packet. So here we expect that we have a variable called WP. But where is this work pack? Where is this coming from? Right? The, the, this template doesn't say anything about where WP comes from. If you look at the previous template, it's self-contained because it iterates through all the deliverables. It doesn't assume the existence of any kind of external variables. It's self-contained. We can run it against our model and, and collect the, the output. So what we need is some sort of mechanism that will coordinate the execution of these templates and say, well, this template should run against the whole model, this template should run for every work package, this template should run for every task or for every partner, you name it. So EGL has a second embedded language called EGX, which does template coordination, rule-based template coordination. So our transformation has a main EGX file where we say, Right, we have this rule that says that for every work package, we will run this template and we will put the results in this file. Okay? So this will run against our model and it will produce, this will run against our model twice, one for every work package, and it will produce a wp1.html and a wp2.html. <coughs> Um, okay, it's better if we actually see that in practice. contain work packages, uh, which in turn contain deliverables. And here I have a small model that conforms to this special model. So I have two deliverables here. Yes. 
thank you. Okay, so here we have uh, our project which contains two work packages which contain our two deliverables. So this is how our model to text transformation looks like. So we have this rule which transforms every instance of work package into a file with a HTML suffix under the gen folder over here. And this calls this template wp to html.egl down here, which is the code that I, sh that I showed you. How do we run this? Unsurprisingly, we need to create a new run configuration like we did before for EOL and EVL. This time we have to choose the EGL generator option. And that selects the EGX uh, coordination uh, program. And then we go to the models tab. We add an EMF model. We'll call it M. We'll select our demo project as, uh, as source. And we don't want to save it in case we make any changes to it. So now when I run this, two new files have appeared under the gen folder, right? And these are the HTML files for my, two, uh, for my two work packages. I can open them with a text editor. You can see uh, the content that was, uh, that was generated, <coughs> okay? Um, I could have more than one rules, uh, so I could create for example, another, uh, I could create another template here. New file, and I'll call it uh, deliverable to HTML. And then that will print the title of the deliverable. then uh, well the, uh, the the idea of the deliverable and then its title okay so now in order to run this template for all the deliverables in my model I would need to go here and create another rule that transforms all deliverables and it uses this template and then it puts the output in gen d d dot p dot number dot number dot html and I may have missed something yeah good okay and I think I'm missing a dot here no I have my dot here fine so now if I run my transformation again you will see how I'm also getting one file for every uh, for every deliverable in my generated folder. Any questions so far? No. Template. <laughs> the same thing. So so if you wanted to affect this file, yeah. you would have to change the template that produces it. Right? If you wanted to generate more files for every deliverable, then you need different templates.
Okay. Um, so it's very nice when we can consume our model and we can produce uh, we can produce code and that code is complete, right? So nothing is missing. We're done. We can just ship the the output. But you will find that in many cases models don't really contain all the information we need in order to produce the final product. So for example, uh, when we are modeling research projects in our model, we capture information about the work packages, what deliverables they produce, and so on and so forth. But what we submit to the funder is not just tables of, of titles. At some point, we need to explain what work we're going to do. And for that, we need paragraphs of text, and we need images, and we need like lots of, uh, lots of stuff to uh, complete that, uh, that skeleton. And of course, uh, in many of these cases, you don't want to put that information in your model. So you don't want to write paragraphs and paragraphs of text without, within your, your model. So therefore, you end up with a situation where you need to augment the generated content with some handwritten content that doesn't live uh, in the model. And of course, we could generate uh, our first version of the, of the proposal, and then we could go and type in the extra content, but then we're eff effectively uh, done with the generator. So if we change our model again, if we add new deliverables, we cannot rerun our generator because it will override our handwritten content. And there are four strategies for avoiding this. Right? It's a very common issue. Uh, there are different strategies to integrate uh, handwritten and uh, generated content. The first one is called protected regions. And this is a mechanism that uh, model-to-text transformation languages offer, where you can mark a region of the template as protected. In EGL, this is done using these two dedicated uh, operations, start preserve and stop preserve. And this will trigger the generation of special comments in the generated file that the generator will know to preserve in the next execution of the, um, of the generator. So here, for example, if we wanted to have a description for a, for a work package in our template, we could add these three lines. So we could add a start preserve, a call to start preserve, and give it a, 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 a sequence of characters that is a valid start starting comment uh, delimiter for our target language, and the same for an end comment delimiter, and then an ID for that region. And then we could create some space to accommodate uh, handwritten content, and then uh, provide some kind of default content, and then call stop preserve. When we execute this template, it's going to produce this output. So it's going to create a protected region with an ID uh, and it's going to say that one begin. And then we have some space to write our, our content. And then it creates another comment that says that this protected region is now ending. Is now ending. So let's go to our uh, back to Eclipse, this Eclipse. <coughs> So this is the template. This is a modified template with uh, three more lines with a start preserve and, and stop preserve. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this transformation. I'm going to change my EGX file so that it uses this modified template that makes use of protected regions. And I will run my transformation again. Fine. Now, if I open this using a text editor, mm -hmm. you will see that I'm getting this protected region here. So I'll go and change the, the text here, and I'll say, well, this is uh, a work package about requirements and use cases. OK? And I'm also going to go to my model, and I'm going to change the title of this. Yeah. 
and I'm going to rerun my transformation. So what will happen now is the title of the work package will change because I changed that in my model. But this text here that I hand typed has been preserved, right? It hasn't been lost. If I didn't have these two statements here, that text would have been reverted to WP description goes here, right? Questions about how protected regions work? Yes. If you, here, yes, you could do it. You could do that. Now, of course, this won't appear here now because this is a protected region. But if I delete these two and rerun the code generator. We can have anything. It's just text, right? It really depends on the target language, what the semantics of this text. So uh, EGL doesn't make an effort to understand what's, what's in here. It just finds it and, and preserves it, puts it back in the generated file. So uh, this is a first strategy we can use to kind of um, integrate <coughs> handwritten and auto-generated content. Another approach is to use uh, the facilities of the target language in order to import or include generated content from non-generated content so that we can keep the two completely separately. We, cannot, we don't have to edit the generated files because all sorts of things can happen and uh, uh, you know, you might, for example, reorder work packages, in which case the file names will change, and then the generator will start getting shaky. Um, so whenever you can, it's a good idea to keep generated from non-generated content separately. So for example, if you're generating Java code, you could uh, generate base classes for the classes that you want to customize. And then your base class is fully generated, and all the kind of all the interesting content goes into, um, say, classes that extend these, these base classes. Um, this is actually what we do for, for writing a grant proposal. So we generate a big uh, a file of LaTeX commands based from information from the model. And then we import these in our main, in our main document, right? so that we don't have to mix generated and non-generated uh, uh, content. Of course, in this case, you need to kind of introduce some bl blanket policy that generated code does not get generated. Put large, large disclaimers in your generated files that says this is generated code. Don't make any changes here because it will be, uh, it will get, they will get lost. And people will still ignore this, but that's fine. Um, another option is to change the actual meta model. So we wanted to add a description for our work packages. Uh, we could just add another attribute to our meta model called description and just put the description there, put these paragraphs of text there, and then we have all the information in our, in our, in our model. Um, so the main advantages is that, well, all the, all the information is in our model and all content can be auto-generated, so we don't need to think about that, that problem. It completely goes away. But then, of course, um, trying to tie paragraphs of text in that small uh, uh, properties uh, text box in Eclipse uh, is not really a, a great idea. Um, you don't get things like syntax highlighting that you would get from your, say, LaTeX ID or from your Java ID. Uh, it's, it's just a very poor way to, to type in text. Plus, in some cases, you're working with fixed languages. So you cannot really change the meta model every time you, every time you need something else. And then the fourth strategy, the one that EMF and GMF follow, is automated content merging. So in this case, we need a, a merging facilities that are aware of the target language um, so that we can mark parts of the generated code as generated or non-generated. And then we have a merger 
that uh, kind of merges the generated content with the existing version of the generated file. Uh, very similarly to what, uh, um, to what protected regions do, but with a, a, a better, uh, like a less invasive syntax. So we don't have to generate lots and lots of comments. Uh, we could have, for example, in HTML, some sort of generated and generated not uh, attribute. This is quite expensive to implement because you need some tool that understands the target language and that uh, uh, encodes some sort of uh, um, scheme for identifying what is generated and what is not and then does merging, etc. It's, it's quite, uh, quite hard to, to implement. Okay, so uh, here on the slides I have a few examples of real world code generators projects like Apache Thrift uh, from Facebook and Google Protocol Buffers and Jekyll and so on and so forth. Uh, you can have a look at this at your, own, uh, at your own time. And with that, we will move to model to model transformations. Any questions about model to text before we move on to model to model? No? Okay. So let's press on then and move to model to model transformation where Again, we consume models, but now we don't produce text, we produce other models. Models that potentially conform to different meta-models. Why do we want to do that? For example, to extract simpler views from complex models, to migrate models when there are meta-models involved, right? This is what we discussed yesterday. If you have your meta-model and you've constructed big models, and at some point you decide to change the name of a, of a class, you don't want to either throw the model away uh, or to go into the XMI and kind of fix your model there. In this case, we could write a model transformation from the old version of the meta model to the new version of the meta model, and we could automatically uh, migrate our, uh, our models. Model to model transformation is also used uh, commonly to modularize a model to text transformation. So if the domain of your DSL is too far away from the, um, from the implementation language, you can interject model to model transformation steps to get kind of progressively closer and closer until the model to text transformation becomes uh, much easier. And this is an example we'll see uh, later on in this, uh, in this lecture. So. There's no shortage of model-to-model -model transformation languages out there. Um, most of them are compatible with EMF and eCore, but we can observe three different styles, broadly speaking. So we have purely imperative languages like EOL and QVTO, which are really scripting languages that can access models, so you can encode your transformation as a kind of regular imperative pro program. We have declarative languages such as QVTR and Hensin, which are relation-based, um, where you get very high-level specifications of what the transformation, pretty much of the end result, and then it's up to the transformation engine to figure out how to achieve that, that end result. And when you can express a, a transformation um, using one of these languages, they are great, right? Because you have a, a very kind of pure definition of your transformation, and then you can reason about it, you can, you can prove properties of your transformation, very nice. The problem is that they are not always applicable, so they're not, they're not extremely expressive, they're not very expressive, so for more complex transformations, you'll find that you, you, you could struggle uh, with getting the transformation engine to do what you, what you want it to do. And then what is considered the happy medium, somewhere in between the kind of raw power of imperative transformations and the nice style of uh, declarative transformations? are hybrid, hybrid transformation languages such as ATL and ETL, which we're going to see today, uh, which provide declarative rules with, uh, the, with the ability to fall back to, uh, an imperative, uh, to imperative statements for the, for the difficult transformations, for the complex transformations. So we're going to talk about uh, ETL this language over here, we talked about EGL, which is the model to text transformation language. Now we're going to talk about, uh, about ETL. Okay, so ETL is a rule-based model to model transformation language. <coughs> it builds on top of EOL, so whatever we've seen about EOL also applies to, to ETL. And it provides primitives for a resolution of target elements from source elements. 
and for and for rule uh, scheduling. We can also have a rule inheritance. We can in, uh, inherit between rules, and we can guard rules so that they apply to a subset of model elements. Um, so we saw how we could we could write a transformation that consumes a research project model and produces a set of HTML files, right? Um, so one HTML table for all deliverables and one HTML table for the deliverables of every work package. Now what we will do now is we will break it down. We will simplify this transformation by injecting a model to model transformation. So we will go from a research project model to a structured content model and then from a structured content model to HTML. So instead of going straight from research project to HTML, we will add another model to model transformation step and an intermediate model here. And the advantage of doing that is that essentially we are decoupling uh, the, the transformation to that particular fr format from the transformation to just tables, essentially. So then if we wanted to transform to LaTeX or to another representation that transforms, that, that supports tables, uh, we could just replace this part. We don't have to re-implement the whole thing. So in order to do that, I will need to create a new meta model for this intermediate model. I'll call it structured content meta model. And then I'll need to write a transformation that takes a research project model and produces a structured content model. So what these transformations should do is to transform instances of this meta model into instances of this meta model. This is my structured content meta model, where my concepts are content, which contains tables, and tables contain rows, and rows contain cells. Right? So this is very close to my implementation domain now. This is close to my problem domain. This is close to my implementation domain, but still not a concrete artifact I could, I could deliver. OK, how do we do that? ETL transformations are organized into rules. So uh, not very dissimilarly to what we saw with EGX. So in ETL, we can have a rule uh, called project to deliverables table, which transforms all instances of project from the research project model right, to tables in the structured content model. And here you can see how in previous, uh, in previous Epsilon programs, I, I was typing something like var A of type action. Uh, now I have to qualify these types and say which model they come from, because now more than one models are involved in the program. We have a source model, which is the research project model, and the structured content model, which is the output model. So we have two models we have to, to qualify uh, references to, to type names from these models. So the ID of this table becomes project deliverables, and then we create a row in the table. Uh, this is the header row. And then for every deliverable, uh, we create another row in this table um, with the ID of the, of the deliverable, the number of its work package, and its due date. Right? So this will run for every project it will create a table and it will run the con it will run these these statements now for every work package we also want to create a table and that table should contain uh, its uh, its deliverables we can have a guard in our rule that says that this rule should only be invoked if the de if there are actually deliverables in this uh, uh, in this work package. If there are no deliverables, we don't produce a table for it. The idea of that table would be um, WP plus the number of the work package plus underscore deliverables because that, that's the deliverables of this work package. We would create a row. Uh, this is the header row again with. The, just the titles of the of the different columns of the table, and this is interesting because here we say that uh, the rows of the table we want to add the equivalence of deliverables of work packet of the work package to the rows of the table. So on the left hand side here we have rows, we have table rows. 
on the right hand side we have deliverables what equivalent will try to do is to find another ETL rule that can transform deliverables to rows which is the next rule in the next rule we say that we want to transform every deliverable into one row in the output model um, which has one cell for its ID, one cell for its title, and one cell for its due date. And then we have a number of uh, operations, uh, operation definitions for create row and create cell and, and stuff like that. And then at the end, so what we haven't done so far is we haven't put all of these tables that we've created, we haven't put them under a content object. Remember, if you look at our meta model, this is the, the content object. So far we have created tables and we have created rows and cells and we have linked them up, but we haven't created the content element under which all tables live. So ETL, like EBL, like EGX, they support a post block. Actually, they support a pre block and a post block. The pre block is statements that will run before any rules are executed. The post block will run at the end of the transformation after all rules have executed. So what we're doing here is we're creating a new content element um, in our structured content model and we're adding all the tables that we've created so far under that content and then we're done. Session? Yes. So we are, uh, we are adding all the equivalents of the deliverables of this work package to the rows of the table. So where does that lead to the transformation? So this one mm -hmm. yeah. will know to call this rule. We know by itself? Yes, exactly. We don't need to specify that we need to call this rule. It will look at the type, uh, at, the expect at the type that this, uh, of this collection. So it will know that what I'm getting here is deliverables, and it will find a rule that can transform deliverables into something else in the target model, right? And this is the rule that does that. So it will look at, at the rules of the transformation and it will decide which rule it needs to execute. Okay? Say again? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because the, they encode the logic of your transformation. If, I, if if you just see the meta models, it's not clear that every work package needs to become a table. You know, it could be the case that every work package needs to become a cell, and every deliverable should become a table. There is some logic in the transformation, and that's what we are expressing in in our ETL. Okay. And so there may be some like different semantic. How do you mean? Uh, like, um, um, there could be like three and the other part has four. So in some of them... Uh, three what and four uh, what? It's, uh, three uh, components. Uh, so this meta model has three types and this yeah. one has four. Uh, so I mean like uh, if we are uh, transforming it, uh, then, then there will be a problem of like, you know, Meaning uh, there could be like uh, three parts has uh, um, could be uh, modularized into four or other things. I'm not sure. And so this in this case we have a source meta model with three types, mm -hmm. and the target meta model with four types, right? And what I've shown is how we can actually transform a model that conforms to this meta model to a model that conforms to that meta model, mm -hmm. and this is a valid transformation. This is what we wanted to do. So the number of types in the source and the target meta model are not important. Uh, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. A transformation is not a one-to-one -one mapping that I will transform all A's into a B and then all C's into a D and like map their properties. This is a very, very simple form of transformation. In most cases, you will find that meta models are different in size. They're different in complexity. And that is the job of the transformation, to actually encode the intended mapping between the two uh, meta models. Okay.
good. So now we can. Uh, so now what I'm. So we have this transformation now, right? That transforms a research project model into a structured content model, and we need to write a transformation that takes a structured content model and creates a HTML file. So we need an EGX file that transforms uh, every table in the structured content model into uh, a HTML file. And this is a new template called table to HTML. And of course, this table now is ridiculously simple because the, the language, the modeling language we're working with is very close to our target domain. So static table tag for every row in the table create a, a row in the a HTML row for every cell create a HTML cell and that's it right it simplifies the transformation yes 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 because we've now done this work in our model to model transformation so in, from our, in a model to model transformation, we have produced table model elements and row model elements. Hmm? Exactly. So now we're going through the output. So now, so we had the model to model transformation that produced tables and, uh, and rows and columns and cells. And now what we're doing is we're consuming the output of this transformation to produce HTML. So we don't have to consume work packages and deliverables anymore. We just consume tables and rows and, and cells. OK, and of course, if we wanted to target LaTeX now instead of HTML, we could write another very small transformation that just produces LaTeX. And we don't have to repeat again how we transform uh, work packages to tables and deliverables to tables, etc. And the factor that out in our model to model transformation. Okay, let's have a quick look at how this works in practice. Right. So this is our. Um, this is our uh, source model, and this is our transformation, the one I the one I just showed you. So I'm going to run this transformation. I will delete this. We'll create a new run configuration. It picks up the name of the transformation. And then here, in all my previous uh, demonstrations, I was just adding one model. Now I will need to add two EMF models. One is a source model, one is a target model. So my source model is called Research Project. And now the name is important because it's whatever name I use to refer to my model from within my transformation. It's not the name of the meta model. It's not the file extension. It's nothing like that. It's the name I'm using to refer to my model from my transformation. I could call this M1, and then here I would have to use the same name, right? So the file is the same, this demo project.model. And because this is the source of my transformation, I want to read the file, but I don't want to make to save any changes I make to it. Yes. 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 Uh, well, the name, the all the so the name should be the name here should be whatever name you've used to refer to your model in the transformation, which might be different to the name of the meta model, different to the file name of the model. 
No, because they because what you uh, because you could have, for example, many models of the same meta model, right? And you want to say which model these instances come from. Um, model to model transformations are specified at the level of meta model, so we use types defined in the meta model, but they operate on instances of these meta models. And it is conceivable that we have a transformation that consumes a model of, that conforms to a given meta model and also produces a model that, could pr uh, that conforms to the same meta model. Right? So it's not necessary that we produce models that conform to different meta models. Or you could have a transformation that consumes two models that um, uh, conform to the same meta model. And you want to treat them differently. So the meta model is not a unique enough identifier for our models. We need each model to have a, a, a name. right? And that name needs to match what we provide in the run configuration. OK, so we have our first model. The second model, how we should, how we should call it? Mm -hmm. Structured content and uh, okay, uh, so that should be demo content dot model, and of course I'll need to change its meta model. And this is a model that we don't want to read when we start the transformation because it doesn't exist yet, or if, even if it exists, we don't care because it will be generated, but we do want to save. OK, and we're done. We can run our transformation. And we'll get another file here, demo content dot model, this annoying bug here, where we have three tables. One for all the project deliverables, one for the work package one deliverables, and one for the work package two deliverables, right? And here we will see the different, uh, the different cells. Any questions so far? how model to model transformation works. Sir, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, ETL looks more in imperative and it told that ETL is one from the hybrid. It is. So, uh, so if we didn't have rules in ETL, we would have to have four loops, right? There's also this equivalent operation that, uh, um, uh, that resolves the targets of elements from a, from a source model. It's somewhere in between. Even in hybrid languages, even hybrid languages are a spectrum. So yes, ETL is closer to imperative languages than it is to fully declarative languages. But it still provides rules. You can have inheritance between rules and so on and so forth. OK. Um, so this brings me to the last section of this, uh, of this talk, which has to do with uh, transformation chaining. So we saw how we, we wrote a transformation uh, to produce a structured content model from a project model, and then another transformation, a model to text transformation that produces uh, our HTML from that intermediate model. The way we can chain these transformations together in Epsilon is through ANT. So ANT, Apache ANT, is an XML-based build workflow management uh, tool. Uh, it's completely developed completely independently of Epsilon. It's a, a general purpose tool for writing uh, workflows of activities in the, in the Java world. Um, it's platform independent, so it was originally uh, kind of proposed as a platform independent alternative to bus scripts and to uh, Windows batch files. So back in the day, uh, if you wanted to write uh, um, essentially a batch script and you wanted to run that batch script both in, in Linux and on, on Windows, you would essentially have to write two different scripts because of the different commands that Linux and Windows support. So Ant kind of tries to unify this and you have one um, copy 
a statement, for example, that works exactly the same in Windows and on, uh, on Linux. And it's an extensible system, so we can also um, write custom tasks uh, to kind of extend its, its capabilities. And that's what we've done with Epsilon. We've added a number of uh, uh, tasks for the different languages of Epsilon and the different capabilities it, uh, it provides. And then we use this to chain together um, Epsilon programs, but also uh, chain them together with external tools. So we could have, uh, for example, if we were generating Java code, we could have another ant task that at the end of the generation process compiles the code, builds a jar, you know, uploads it to bin tray or, or wherever. So how would we change these uh, transformations in, uh, in ant? This is an ant file. Ant is an XML-based language. Uh, so uh, ant scripts are organized in projects. Uh, and a number of target. Target is like function in, in Ant. And here we're saying that the default target of this build file is the main target. And in here, what we do is we load the research project model from this file over here. And we also specify the meta model URI, so the, the meta model to which that model conforms. And we say that we want to read this model when we start the workflow, when we start the build but we don't want to store it when we, when we finish. We also need to declare the structured content model, where we say that uh, the name of that model is structured content. The model file is this one. Its meta model is different. It's structured content. It's not the same as, as the one above. We don't want to read this file because it's going to be produced by our transformation, but we do want to store it eventually. And then we have our two transformations. So we start with our ETL transformation, which consumes the research project model and produces the structured content model. And here you see that we use this, these nested model uh, tags to specify which models this transformation will have access to. And um, these names, these two names match the names we have given, the local names we have given to our models when we actually load them. So what happens behind the scenes is that all the models that are loaded using such tasks are put into some sort of in-memory model repository, and then transformations and validation constraints, etc., can choose which of these models to operate on. So what happens here is we have a transformation which reads our uh, research project and produces that structured content model. And then in the next step, we have our EGL transformation, which only reads from our structured content model. OK? Mm -hmm. This consume. Yes? Uh, how is that aware of the Epsilon specific tags? Uh, it's a, an extensible system. It has extension points uh, that, that you can write, and you can contribute your own tasks. Uh, you're, you wrote the yes. tags? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we don't need to download the no, it is it is part of the uh, it is part of the epsilon distribution. Um, okay, um, now what's also interesting to do in such chains is to inject some sort of model validation because there may be all sorts of things that are wrong with your model, with your initial model, and you don't want to go through all of these transformation steps if there is an error to start with. So what we can do is we can also add an EVL task before we actually run our model to model and our model to text transformation that will check our model against constraints. And then if constraints fail, it will just fail early and it won't perform any of the transformations. So let's have a look. <laughs> OK, so this is the ant file that I showed you before. So we have our two load model tasks that load the research project and the uh, structured content model. And then we have our ETL transformation 
that operates on these two models, and then the EGL transformation that operates on the structured content model that was produced by the model-to-model -model transformation. And we can also add another step here. So we can add an EVL script. If we look at this, it's a number, it's a constraint that says that the due month of every deliverable needs to be greater than zero. We cannot have uh, negative uh, negative months um, in our uh, in in a deliverable. So the way we run these scripts is slightly different because Eclipse provides a different way for running uh, for running ant scripts. So we need to right click. We don't go to run. Uh, we need to run this as an ant build. And one thing we need to do is we need to go to the JRE tab and say we want to run this in the same JRE as the workspace because by default, Ant will just start a new, uh, a new JRE, right? And we don't want to do that. We want to run this within the context of our workspace. So when I run this, the build will fail because deliverable D1.1 has a negative view month. So my constraint has failed here, which means that none of the other tasks have been executed. So if we look at the deliver at the oh, this annoying attack. Um, if we look at D1.1, indeed we will find that its due month is wrong, right? So we'll fix that and run. Build file again. <coughs> and just delete this. Okay, so here we have both LaTeX uh, tables and and HTML tables for our uh, for our project and for our deliverables. Um, now, what's interesting is that if you think about it, this model over here, this structured content model, doesn't ever need to be saved because it's just an intermediate model. We produce it through the transformation, we consume it through the, the, the code generator. We don't actually need to store it at the end of this workflow. It's just an intermediate artifact. So here, what we're saying is that this is a model that we neither want to, uh, to read or to store. So this is only created in memory, populated by the transformation, consumed by the code generator, and it's never actually stored. Any questions? Yes. So uh, our, our uh, purpose is to create an HTML. Mm -hmm. uh, file from mm -hmm. our uh, model that describes our project. Yes, so uh, to generate many HTML files right. in this case. So could you give us like a little bit of motivation as of why we need to create an intermediate model? Because theoretically, you can write like a slightly more complicated generator mm -hmm. from the initial model to the final HTML file. Which is what we started with. Yes. But here, Using, by reusing the same model-to-model -model transformation, we can create small model-to-text transformations that generate LaTeX and HTML. And we don't have to replicate uh, all, that, all that logic across the two, the two model-to-text transformations. Essentially, we factor out the difficult part yeah. in the context of a model-to-model -model transformation, and then we produce um, a model to, we, then we have to write a much simpler model to text transformation. This is useful, for example, if you had some sort of model and you wanted to generate code in, uh, uh, which is a very common scenario in, say, Java and C Sharp, you would want to factor out the difficult part of your transformation into a, transfer, into a model to model transformation that produces some sort of object oriented model. So that then your model to text transformations into Java, into C sharp, into Python, they become trivial. It, it just it degrees the modularity of the exactly. 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 
Yes. Yeah. So you factor out parts of the transformation into reusable into reusable assets. So we specify transformations at the level of meta models, but we execute them at the level of models. Um, when you say from, it's it's ambiguous. So as I said, we specify them at the level of a meta model. So when we write our transformation, we refer to concepts at the meta model level. But when we actually run them, we run them on instances of these meta models. We run them on models that conform to these meta models. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay, so I only have one last, uh, one last slide uh, for you. So just to summarize what we've talked about, this is, uh, this is the last lecture for this week. Just to quickly refresh your memory before we, we talk about your uh, group project. We started uh, the week by talking about uh, the foundations of model-driven engineering. We talked about models in software engineering, about prescriptive and descriptive models. We talked about uh, what the essence of model-driven engineering is and when uh, it is useful. Which got us into a discussion about domain-specific languages because very often in model-driven engineering processes we need domain-specific models to get the level of precision we need to uh, to achieve uh, um, uh, code generation to uh, to achieve like a high 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 quality of code generation. Uh, we talked about domain-specific tools, uh, in particular EMF and GMF, and how we can use them to define the abstract syntax of domain-specific languages, but also uh, graphical editors for them. And today we talked about uh, languages for managing models, for writing constraints against them and querying them and transforming them into other models and eventually uh, into text. So that kind of summarizes what we've talked about. Now it's on to you uh, for your group project. So I have only a couple of slides for that. So after the lunch break, you need to start working on your group project that goes all the way until 11 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. And that's because we'll need the 11 to 12 slot uh, for group presentations. So you're expected to work in groups to develop a model-driven engineering solution uh, and to then present your solution with your group tomorrow from 11 uh, to 12. You can choose the topic of your project. So if there's something in particular that you'd like to work on, you go ahead and do that. It should involve the development of some sort of domain-specific language, some validation constraints, and some sort of model-to-text transformation to produce something, something tangible. Um, I have two possible topics. If you have kind of run out of ideas, if you don't know what you want to, to implement, and you could implement these ideas or you could uh, uh, you know, think about them, maybe change them a little bit, adapt them to your own preferences. So the first one, the easy uh, topic, is a maze game. So here we would need some sort of uh, um, domain-specific language for describing uh, mazes with, uh, with rooms. And the idea is that the user starts in the first room of the maze, and in order to move to the next room, they need to answer a question uh, correctly, either by typing in something or by selecting from a list of options. And of course, your game could be evil, and if the user provides the wrong answer, they could just send them down the wrong path. They could just not tell, tell the user that, they, that, that this is the wrong answer. They could just mislead them and take them deeper into the maze, right? Um, in terms of implementation, you should write a model to text transformation that uh, generates a HTML page for every room. So it could look something like this. That could be like the first, the first room where you need to type in the capital of Iceland in order to, uh, to move uh, next. And then that takes you to the next room where you need to select between these two options um, 
and if you get it right, you move in the right direction, so towards the exit of the maze. If you get it wrong, then maybe the game sends you down uh, a, uh, a longer path. So any questions about this scenario? This is quite straightforward, I think, how you would implement uh, something like this. OK. Um, now, a much more interesting and challenging, challenging example um, is this one where what we have here is a component language where we can define uh, for a system, we can define a number of sensors and then a number of sinks and the number of components in between that take the values of these sensors, they do something with, with them and then they produce results and the results can feed into other components and so on and so forth. So you could have a very complex topology of components. But all from a flat list of sensors and going to a flat list of sinks. Now, from this model, you could write a model to text transformation that produces the actual logic that invokes these components. So every, each one of these components would have a compute method which takes as inputs whatever the component has as ports and then it produces as output whatever the component has as outputs. So you could write a model to text transformation that produces this kind of code. So it exposed the whole model as a class which has a compute method which has one argument for every sensor and uh, it returns whatever the component returns, the, the model uh, returns in its sync. And then what it does here is it instantiates these components and it calls their compute methods and then it takes that result and it fits it, for example, into the multiplier down here. What you cannot describe in this model is what these components actually do, the fact that they add their inputs or they multiply their inputs. This you will have to do with handwritten code. So while this code can be generated from your model, the user or your developer would need to write this code manually. So the developer can specify what each individual component does and then the job of your transformation is to put all of these together according to the model and to, to chain them and to produce the output of the whole model from the input. Any questions so far? Okay. So this is the easy part of this more challenging problem. What is ev what's going to be even more interesting is to using exactly the same uh, code implemented by your by your user is to enable reactive execution of this uh, uh, of the of the model so that if you start and you create an instance of your model and you set its x to uh, to 1 then the result the output should be null because you don't have all the inputs you need so in order for this model to produce outputs you need to have an x a y and a z right so when you, s when you feed it an x, it returns null. When you feed it a, a y, it still returns null because it's missing a z. When you feed it a z, then it actually performs the computation and it returns 9. So 1 plus 2 times 3. And then when you feed it another z, it prints 12. It returns 12, but without actually rerunning the other. Right? So when you feed it that z, that triggers the whole computation the first time, and you get back 9. When z becomes 4, it knows that none of these two have changed. So it reuses the result of this computation, and it just performs the second computation. And it produces an, an output. That's going to be fun. OK, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions about this, uh, this example? Uh, yes. Which is the, the general question. Mm -hmm. uh, how can someone interact with the model? So, so far, we have to fit some inputs into a model, like master producing a model. Mm -hmm. 
based on that escape route you were saying about Java and something, mm -hmm. is there no way we can have something which is interactive? So what you're going to do is you're going to take your model and you're going to generate a set of HTML pages. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to interact with your system. The mo no, no, you need to transform it into something concrete, right? In this case, you need to transform it to Java. In this other example, you need to transform it to HTML and possibly JavaScript. Then you can and then you interact with the generated artifacts, not with the model itself. Same, same thing. You can use model to text transformation. Instead of generating HTML, you can generate Java. It's just text. Java is just text. Yes. Just. <laughs> yeah. Good. If there are no more questions, we can break for, uh, for lunch. And uh, now in the afternoon, self-organize, whether you prefer to work in this room or go elsewhere, you have from... Uh, uh, 1 o'clock until 11 o'clock tomorrow, distribute your time, <coughs> decide how you want to, to work. I will be around until 4 in case you have questions about model to text, model to model transformation, uh, but no, it's up to you. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>